Welcome to the This is Public Health lecture. We're pleased that you're able to join us here in person and online this evening. The University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, the lecture will be about 40 minutes long, followed by about 15 minutes for Q&A afterwards. And for those of you here in the lecture theater, we'll, I will be running around with the microphone, so just put up your hand and wave, and I'll come to you. If you're online at the end of the lecture, you can type your question into the chat box. Uh, for those of you joining online, oh, pardon me, sorry, photographs and video recordings are being made this evening. So if you have any questions or concerns about that, you can approach me or anybody else with a gold name tag and uh, let us know. And when you came into the theater, you received an evaluation. If you could please take the time to fill that out before you leave and drop it in the boxes or the baskets just outside the doors. If you are on Twitter, feel free to tweet the event tonight using the hashtag TIPH lecture. And afterwards, there will be a reception in the foyer. We invite you to join us. Uh, our speaker will be available to continue the conversation and answer some questions out there. It's now my pleasure to introduce our Dean, Shanti Johnson, and uh, she will introduce our speaker for the evening. Thank you, Nisa. Good evening. Welcome to those of you in the room and those with us online. Thank you for joining us for our public lecture series called This is Public Health. These lectures are for us to learn and to think critically about our public health issues faced by people and populations, both locally and globally. Public health crosses multiple fields of study, such as health, social, and human sciences. It touches every aspect of our lives on a daily basis. Public health aims to protect health and also to prevent illness. To work, it works to ensure all people have fair and equitable opportunities to enjoy good health and well-being. Tonight's lecture will focus on inequalities that exist which limits some people and populations from achieving that goal. If you're poor, you may not be able to afford safe and secure housing. If you live in a remote area, you may not have access to affordable and healthful food. If you're a woman, your income may be less than that of a man doing the same job. Perhaps some of these inequalities exist among us here. Dr. Ro Roman Pubayo is our speaker tonight. He will explain how the gaps between the haves and have-nots in society affects both our physical and mental health. Dr. Pabayo is an assistant professor here in the School of Public Health. As a social epidemiologist, Dr. Pabayo examines how the conditions in which we are born, live, work, and interact with others impact our health. One of his current research projects is investigating the relationship between income inequality in Calgary neighborhoods and associating that with maternal and newborn health. Dr. Pabayo believes that his work is not just about public health, it's about social justice. With that note, please join me in welcoming Dr. Pabayo. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, she pretty much gave my whole talk already, so I'll go home. Um, joking. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming today um, and hearing a discussion or a talk about social determinants of health. So um, basically, uh, as a health researcher, I study the social determinants of health, and they're defined by the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And it's a complex model, and it's not just about the individual. So as a health researcher, I'm, I'm attracted to the social determinants of health, mainly because it's so, um, it's, it's often um, common for um, people to be blamed for their health conditions. And um, the social determinants of health framework model, which is endorsed by the World Health Organization, um, describes or, or illustrates what affects our health in a complex manner, right? So it's not so easily to blame people for their, whether it be their choices um, 
uh, in their behaviors, which have an impact on their health. Also, the social determinants of health, um, what's also too important to stress, is that it's shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources. And so what that means is that not everyone has, equitable, has the same access to money, power, and resources. Some people have more than others. And that has an impact on health. So here's an example of the social determinants of health framework. As you can see, it's very complex. You have individual characteristics and behaviors and um, how we interact with each other affecting our health. But what's also important to notice or to observe is that the social and economic and political context um, plays a role on our individual factors and behaviors and therefore our health. So again, it's more complex than just blaming the individual or identifying individual choices on their health behaviors and also the, and, and therefore on their health outcomes. So this is um, a graph, a figure from the Canadian Medical Association. Right away, um, uh, I'm not a big fan of the title, what, what Makes Canadians Sick? I like to take more of a holistic approach and look at um, what what drives uh, Canadians' uh, health and well-being, okay? So um, according to the uh, Canadian Medical Association, around 50% of our of determinants of our health is um, predicted by our uh, uh, social determinants of health. So for example, our income, our disability, our social exclusion, our gender, our education, all these factors, around 50%, um, play uh, a role in our health and uh, overall health, and that trumps over biology, so our genetics, okay? So again, I'm gonna go back to what the implications of the distribution of determinants of health. So that means that there's inequalities. So there's haves and have-nots. Some people have more access to power, money, and resources than others. And, um, but two terms come up, inequalities and inequities. What are the difference between the two? Um, people use them interchangeably, but they are different. Well, inequalities are differences, variations, and disparities. Um, something like our genetic differences, right? There was, uh, sometimes it's just by luck, we get genetic, um, uh, uh, we get our genes that um, make us more susceptible to certain diseases, okay? Um, so those are inequalities. Um, another difference is, uh, another inequality um, is age. Someone, at, someone who is 80 year, 80 year old, an 80 year old is more likely to, um, to die in comparison to someone who's 12. So these inequalities um, are sort of natural. When it comes to inequities, these are inequalities, so inequities are inequalities that are unfair or stemming from some social injustice. Okay, so some policy that is driving this inequality, okay? So I'm gonna go more in detail with that for the, throughout this lecture. So here's an example of um, equality versus equity, okay? So everyone here on the, on the left um, is on the same footing, okay? So what happens to the person here, the, lower, the, the short person, little guy? Doesn't benefit, okay? Can't see over the fence. Equity is we bring everyone at a level where everyone benefits. So here, um, on the right, the little guy can now see over the fence, okay? Based on what has been done to make things more equitable. Okay, so access to power is also um, a determinant of health. Um, as the social determinants of health framework indicates is that there is um, differential or differences in, in access to power. Let's look at um, the differences between um, women, indigenous, and visible minorities, the proportions of the Canadian population and Alberta population, and compare it to um, the members of parliament and also the uh, members of uh, uh, Alberta's legislative assembly. So women make up 50% of Canada's population but roughly only 26% of Canada's MPs. And there are 4% indigenous popu uh, 4 of Canada's population is indigenous, and 3% of the, of the uh, members of parliament are, um, are indigenous. And 19% um, 
of uh, Canada's uh, population as visible minorities, while only 14% are members of parliament. Okay, similar um, trends when it comes to Alberta, except for there are no indigenous uh, members of uh, le the legislative assembly currently. Does anybody know how many, historically, how many MLAs there are, have been, that are indigenous, that have been indigenous? Three, okay. Um, so when we break these numbers down by uh, women and, and uh, visible minorities, um, in Canada, two out of the 10 um, uh, members of parliament are women. Um, so yeah, two of the 10 indigenous um, MPs are women. So one of them's in, in the news right now, uh, making a lot of headlines, uh, jo uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould. So, um, and also there's 16, 16 out of the 47 visible minority MPs um, are women, okay? When it comes to Alberta's MLAs, two are women and one are non-binary, okay? So, um, this is a representation or an example of how um, who represents or who has the power does not necessarily reflect um, uh, the, uh, the country's population and, and its makeup. So here are the four leaders of the federal um, parties um, vying, to be the, vying to be the next uh, prime minister with the election of uh, Jagmeet Singh um, last, last month. We have uh, pretty much a more diverse group of uh, leaders um, in the history of Canada. Uh, we have a woman, um, not the first woman, um, Elizabeth May of the Green Party. But traditionally and historically, sorry, historically, in Canada, is, um, has the, the leaders of the parties and also our prime ministers have traditionally, have historically been white men um, from high income backgrounds. And so these are the people that help, um, that these are our leaders that uh, implement and um, uh, implement the laws and legislation that affect our health and well-being. So when it comes to um, in a social inequality, um, these social inequalities are expressed biologically um, through health inequalities. So we embody and biologically express experience of social and economic inequality, for example, in poverty, people living in poverty, they're not um, able to buy nutritious food or live in affordable housing, and that affects their health. People who experience discrimination, um, they too will also experience health inequalities. So discrimination is defined as the process by which a member or members of a socially defined group is or are treated differently, especially unfairly, because of his or her or their membership of that group. This unfair treatment arises from, arises from socially de uh, derived um, beliefs each group holds about the other in patterns of dominance and oppression viewed as expressions of a struggle for power and privilege. So examples of discrimination include um, discrimination based on race, ethnicity, Aboriginal status, gender, sexuality, disability, age, nationality, religion, and social class, among others. Um, now, intersectionality are those who are most marginalized in society are those who fall under multiple forms. So if a woman, um, so a woman who is uh, a visible minority and a religious minority, they're more likely to experience multiple forms of discrimination and oppression. So here's an example of um, intersectionality. So does anybody, has anyone heard of um, Lindsay Shepard? Okay, so Lindsay Shepard was a TA at, at Laurier University um, in a communications class. She showed a debate featuring Jordan Peterson. Now, Jordan Peterson has been a critique, a critic of so uh, political correctness and use of gendered uh, neutral prono pronouns. This raised concern amongst, amongst the LGBTQ communities um, in, uh, in uh, sorry, in Laurier University. And, uh, she was reprimanded by her supervisor and the, the chair of the department. And so it was made public. The press picked it up really quickly. MPs and MPPs of Ontario um, rallied to her defense, um, arguing what hap what's going on in Canadian universities, Ontario universities, um, what's going on with the freedom of speech um, and freedom of expression. 
Now contrast that with, um, with Masuma Khan. Has anyone heard of Masuma Khan? Okay. So she was a leader, she's a leader, um, a student leader in Dalhousie University. And so during the Canada 150 um, uh, celebrations, she was a, an advocate um, to not to endorse Canada Day celebrations on campus due to 400 years of genocide and colonialism. And uh, she faced harsh criticism and, um, and pretty much criminalized. If you look at the wording in the, the titles, like when it comes to Lindsay Shepard, words such as brave, um, uh, brave, uh, fight for free speech, um, heroic are used. But when it comes to Masuma Khan, words like, um, you know, she's pretty much criminalized, okay, for, for, for her um, Freedom of Speech Act. So this is an example of um, intersectionality where you have um, a woman who is a visible minority and also a religious minority experiencing um, harsh uh, discrimination um, on more than, you know, on, on these two, uh, um, be, being a member of these two groups, three groups. So I'm gonna um, attempt to show a video of what could be, what are the, how, how inequality um, can affect us. So I've shown it in several in my class. But let's see, if hopefully it works. If not, I could walk you through it. Oh, good. The final experiment that I want to mention to you is our parents. Uh, so this is this is a very funny study of how many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, So I apologize, the people at home could not hear um, or see that video, uh, but you could email me and I'll send you the link. Um, so that's an example sort of, of what can happen um, when there's inequality. Um, you know, so the monkeys were feeling fr frustrated who did not receive um, sort of the equal pay for equal work. Can someone think of an example of where equal, oh, actually Dr. Shanti Johnson already mentioned how um, women um, 
uh, get paid like, a lot less than uh, than men. I think it's 0 0.87 cents, sorry, 87 cents per dollar that women make less. Um, so according to the Canada, Canadian Women's Foundation, Canada is ranked as having the eighth highest pay gap out of a list of 43 countries examined by OECD countries, so um, high income countries um, in 2016. So why are un un unequal societies bad for our health? So this is a picture um, in a city in Brazil, I believe it's Sao Paulo. So you have, um, on the right, you have, a, a uh, you have a nice, luxurious condo with tennis courts and a swimming pool. And then you have this, you keep, um, some people can't see the wall here. Now the other side is um, poverty, uh, an impoverished neighborhood. So um, can anyone think of what could possibly, um, what sort of feelings or what, could, what result could happen when you have these two communities um, these, these two very unequal communities living side by side like this. The fact that there's a wall here in both sides. Can anyone think of an, an example or think of something? Resentment. So, resentment, right? So people in the impoverished side could feel resentment towards the people living in these luxurious um, neighborhoods. How about the luxurious neighborhood, people living in there? Fear. Right? Fear, stress, anxiety. I mean, they have a wall here for a reason. Right? And so fear, stress, anxiety, and even resentment can have um, adverse consequences on our health. Here's another example in Edmonton. This is the um, Rogers Place. Um, uh, online, it says it represents white privilege. And this is the Boylston Street uh, Center, com uh, Center Community, Community Center. Um, which serves the homeless in Edmonton. So you have, you know, two, um, you know, um, uh, a neighborhood of privilege and underprivileged living side by side. So how can income inequality damage population health? So there have been several mechanisms involved. I'm going to name a couple of them. Uh, absolute income effect, effect. So when you have high income inequality in a particular area, you have greater number of people living in poverty, um, and they have lack, they have they lack access to resources and social programs. Uh, another mechanism is social comparisons and relative deprivation. This could lead to frustration, stress, and depression. So when you have high income inequality, people. Um, naturally tend to uh, compare themselves with each other, and this could lead to stress, uh, stress, frustration, depression, similar to what happens with, with the monkeys um, in the video, uh, and contextual effect of income inequality, so the erosion of social cohesion. Now, social cohesion is the trust um, or the glue between members of a society, and so when you have inequality, this, ero this um, trust or glue is eroded. And um, we know that social cohesion um, is related, has been shown to be related to other uh, health behaviors such as physical activity and also um, adverse health outcomes. So high social cohesion leads to lower risk or lower um, depressive, uh, lower risk for depression or lower depression, depressive symptoms. Um, and these are all, these could be seen as, as linked. So if you have um, an erosion of social cohesion, members of that society are going to be less likely to support social programs. Why should um, I pay for social programs for my, for my neighbors um, uh, um, when, you know, as an um, to help them out when your social cohesion, you know, when, sorry, it's an example of so, uh, an erosion of social cohesion. So through my work, I've looked at the effects of income inequality. So this is the gap between rich and poor um, uh, within a society. So income inequality has been shown to be increased, increased risk for depression or depressive symptoms, uh, aggression and violence, post-traumatic stress disorder and coronary heart disease and mortality. So I'm gonna go through some examples. So before I came to Edmonton, I was living in the US for seven years, and uh, this is Boston. So orange is where all the where there's high income inequality, and green is where there's low income inequality. So there's it's um, so green is uh, more of an equitable distribution of incomes. So 
what we found was that um, income inequality is related to aggression among boys. So boys living in high income inequality neighborhoods were significantly more likely to experience aggression and violence. So for example, being attacked by someone in a neighborhood with a weapon other than a gun. Okay, so they were more likely to experience um, violence and aggression. Boys living in low, um, sort of high income inequality neighborhoods were more likely to experience aggression or violence in comparison to low um, or moderate income inequality neighborhoods. Um, as for girls, um, we found that girls living in high income inequality neighborhoods had significantly higher depressive symptoms in comparison to the girls living in low. Um, income inequality neighborhoods. So this is sort of um, indicative of how um, there's a gender difference in uh, reaction to living or coping um, with living in neighborhoods with high income inequality. Um, boys tend to externalize um, and girls tend to internalize. So when we look at income inequality um, across the US, across the US states, we see that um, the lighter blue, which is low income inequality, so a more equitable distribution of incomes, and darker colors, high income inequality, you see there's a lot of variability across the US states. Um, so, but also in, um, infant mortality is pretty high in the US and compared to other um, high income countries, high um, OECD countries. So um, the infant mortality rate in the US is around six, um, and the rate um, is a lot higher than in other high-income countries um, of four per 1,000. So when we looked at income inequality within US states, we see that as income inequality states increases, the infant mortality um, increases, the risk for infant mortality increases. So um, Dr. Johnson mentioned um, income inequality across, uh, my study on income inequality across Calgary neighborhoods. Um, here's Cal a map of Calgary. As you can see, there's also a lot of vari variation in income inequality across um, Calgary neighborhoods, the darker blue being the most unequal. So what we observed that only among low or moderate socioeconomic status mothers um, there was an increase in depressive symptoms as inc income inequality increased across um, Calgary neighborhoods. But we didn't find that association among high SES mothers, high socioeconomic status mothers. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk a bit about gender inequality. So this is um, a, uh, a cartoon that I found online. Um, so as women and men um, start uh, in the workforce, women experience a lot uh, more barriers, um, and this has an impact on their ability to be successful at work um, in comparison to men. And what do these, what do these barriers um, have? What effect do they have on health outcomes of, uh, of women? But for this talk, I'm gonna specifically uh, focus on, um, on reproductive rights among women. So does anyone know who said this? It is essential to women's equality with man that she be the decision maker, that her choice be controlling. If you impose restraints that impede her choice, you are disadvantaging her because of her sex. Does anyone know who said that? She's American. I think there are a couple of Americans here. Right. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So you might be asking, okay, so how does this apply to Canada? Uh, Abortion is legal in Canada but there are barriers that still remain in Canada. So in Nova Scotia, you still have to have an ultrasound. Um, a woman has to have an ultrasound before she, she goes, goes through with her abortion. Um, and we know that anti-abortion uh, groups or anti-choice groups um, have been involved and are picking up steam again and trying to sort of chip away, um, try to um, sort of, uh, um, look to the United States and how they've been able to chip away at uh, their, um, um, their, uh, their access to abortion rights. Um, and on the flip side, um, sorry, not on the flip side, but like uh, similarly, um, there have been cases where, um, where women, indigenous women, have been coerced into sterilization. So um, this is uh, an example of uh, another example of impeding on someone's um, uh, right, uh, reproductive rights. So, and this is fairly recent. Um, this came out just last month, and it's been in the news. Um, uh, 
in the last couple of days too. And, um, and so uh, to me, it's an example of intersectionality, again, where, um, where it's indigenous women who are experiencing um, their rights, um, uh, the reproductive rights that are being infringed. Like you wouldn't see this among white women. Um, and, if it were, and if it were to happen, um, I'm sure that the press coverage would be a lot more um, stronger. Um, so here are some examples of laws restricting reproductive rights. Um, this is mostly in the United States, and I've mentioned um, core sterilization here in Canada. Um, so what I did was I looked at the relationship between the number of uh, laws restricting uh, women's reproductive rights and infant mortality risk within the United States. And we found that um, as the number of restrictions increased, the infant mortality rates increased too as well. So I'm gonna um, talk about racism now. So inequality and discrimination harms health. Okay, I think I've um, illustrated that through, um, through income inequality and through gender and now through race. Now racism refers to institutional and individual practices that create and reinforce oppressive symptoms of race relations. So um, I wanted to, uh, this is a, a graph that shows the, um, the racial disparities or the racial differences um, in infant mortality. So black, non-Hispanic infants has a higher, has a higher, uh, experience a higher infant mortality rate in comparison to white or Hispanic or Asian. And you also see that with uh, indigenous populations too as well. They experience a higher infant mortality rate in comparison to white, Hispanic, and Asian um, Pacific Islanders. So structural racism refers to the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through mutually reinforcing systems of housing, education, employment, earnings, benefits, credit, media, healthcare, and criminal justice. So these sectors of society um, uh, sort of reinforce or work together to reinforce structural racism or discrimination based on race. So here's an example in Edmonton. This was just last year. So indigenous women nearly 10 times more likely to be street checked by Edmonton police. Um, so this was a study that was uh, released last year. And so um, if you could think about the harmful effects of always having to worry about um, being um, accused by the police of doing something wrong every time you walk out, the, walk, out, walk out of your house or your apartment. What does that do to your, um, to your mental health, your mental health or to in, in later health at, uh, outcomes? So how is racism harmful? Um, similarly to uh, any kind of inequality, racism can lead to greater psychological stress so again, think back to, you know, if, if you're constantly being harassed by police, um, what kind of psychological stress that could lead to. Um, lead to reduce access to social goods, so social programs, and erode social cohesion. So again, the trust and the glue within society. So when I looked at the relationship between um, structural racism and infant mortality, um, I found, we found that um, as structural racism increases, the estimated proportion of infant deaths increased among black infants only, but not among white infants. So in terms of a call to action, you know, it's um, what can we do to address inequality or inequity? We could redistribute resources, power, and other social de determinants more equitably. And so that, to me, means fighting for social justice. Um, I could go on and on about um, the, the, um, how I feel about the electoral system, but we need to look at how we elect people into positions of power. Um, if I, you know, I'm trying to, you know, when I, um, when I refer to the United States, you know, it's because I spent so much time there. Um, if anyone has seen the documentary um, Reversing Roe was basically reversing um, uh, women's right to, to choose. Has anyone seen that on Netflix? It's a really good documentary. Um, they do a, a, a comparison between having one woman on the Supreme Court, um, Supreme Court with three women um, on the Supreme Court and how um, um, the, the courts um, react or 
um, argue um, abortion cases in the United States. Um, so again, we need to look at how we elect people into, into positions of power, how we can make it more equitable um, among members of society. So um, here's couple, some couple of examples of, uh, of what can be done um, that have been done and have been working really well. So um, I'm not sure if anyone has seen this news um, piece. Um, so Al benefits help slash Alberta child poverty, uh, Alberta's child poverty rate. Okay, so in um, this is due to Canada to, can, uh, to federal and provincial um, be, uh, child benefits. So you can see here that Alberta in 2015 around 10 percent. Uh, the poverty rate, child poverty rate was 10 percent, and now it's 5 percent um, as of 2017 um, due to these uh, these benefits. And also, um, so in Alberta, um, there's been an increase in minimum wage, and um, we're hoping to see that there, are, there, there, there will be benefits to um, sort of shrinking in the, gra the gap between rich and poor. So minimum wage has been proposed to be one way to decrease income inequality, okay? And so um, uh, with um, uh, the project that we're looking for, looking at in Calgary, we're hoping to see um, eventually um, the effect of increasing minimum wage on adverse mental health outcomes amongst mothers in Calgary. So I just want to bring this back to, to uh, the difference between equ equality and equity, is that when we, um, when we create interventions and policies, um, that we remember, that we try to remember, it's about equity and not equality. That we bring forth um, interventions that benefit everyone and not the select few. Thank you. Oh, so I, sorry, sorry, a couple resources. Um, I found this on the uh, Alberta Health Services, offers this, this, um, this, uh, um, this uh, uh, booklet on establishing a province-wide social determinants of health and health equity approach. Um, the website's there too as well. And I'd like to thank um, and acknowledge um, uh, trainees who have worked with on, on some of these projects with me, um, and also my research colleagues, my former mentors um, from the United States and in Canada too as well, Sheila McDonald from Alberta Health Services. And I'd like to also thank MSI Foundation for their funding, their funding the, the project in Calgary, looking at income inequality and um, depressive symptoms among, amongst um, uh, mothers and also uh, policy-wise for, um, for their assistance with the data. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Roman, for that talk. I'm sure you have questions for Roman. If you're in the room, put up your hand and Nisa will bring a microphone. If you're joining us online, uh, type your question on the comment box and Rachel will re re read that question so Roman can respond. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Pabario. Uh, it's a very excellent presentation. Uh, uh, it, it came to my attention that on one of my uh, on one of your slide, you mentioned that the uh, restriction on birth uh, is correlated with the infant uh, mortality, uh, and you argued that the more restriction it has, uh, the the more uh, mortal the infant would be. And so uh, I, I was wondering because in, in the terms of biology, uh, when you have fewer uh, uh, offsprings, you, you put more resource or more uh, effort into bringing up that fewer offsprings, and, and that uh, is supposed to decrease uh, the mortality. And, and so, uh, could you comment on the mechanism by which it works, uh, like in this way, in terms of public health? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, so, when we delve more into um, uh, possible mechanisms. I mean, I mean, it's hard to get to what the mechanisms are, but we, when we stratify by restriction, we could see that it mostly has to do with Medicare restriction. So Medicare is um, public funding, so some states do not allow public funding to, uh, 
for women to have an abortion. So that means that poor women who can't afford it, they don't have access to these funds, and also younger um, teenage moms. So if parental, uh, they need parental permission or parental um, uh, notification in order for them to go through their abortion. And so, um, uh, so what I think it has to do with um, the number of restrictions has to do with, uh, with um, women who are not necessarily ready to go, to go through, to, to have a child, or it's not the best time for them to have a child, and they don't have that option, or it's very difficult to have that option to terminate their pregnancy, and therefore, um, um, and therefore they, they're sort of forced into having the infant, and they're not necessarily, they may not necessarily be ready or health-wise or, or um, financially wise, financially wise, and so therefore um, it affects the health of their baby, of their infant. Does that make sense? Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, so some of the things you talked about, obviously this is societal, but can you, do you have, from your research, and uh, do you have any examples of, of actual communities where perhaps there is, you know, in terms of trying to make change uh, in communities, that there are communities that actually, uh, say, per perhaps even within a province or, okay. uh, or you know, even in the United States, are there communities that have actually um, had success at, at actually sort of trying to deal with uh, the social determinants of health and what you're trying to talk about here? So thank you for, that's a very interesting question. I um, right away the first thing that came to mind was Kerala, India. Anyone know um, where Kerala, India? Or um, when I was studying for my PhD, um, Kerala, India um, is, a, is a province or a state in India. Um, they do a really good job at, of um, more having more of an equitable distribution of uh, of resources, and um, as a result, they have really good health outcomes in comparison to other. Um, uh, uh, in comparison to other um, states in India. Um, try to think of something more, you know, in Canada or, United, or something in North America, um, where, they've, where they've done a better job of making resources more equitable. Um, you know, it's, it's so easy to point out the states that, have, that haven't done that. Um, I think, you know, I looked at Quebec, you know they have their their Gini co so their income inequality coefficients or the Gini coefficient, which we've used to measure income inequality, is a lot lower in comparison to other other provinces. Um, and you know, and uh, to be honest, I'm not actually sure what their health outcomes are in comparison to other other provinces, but they do do a better job at doing of of, um, of equitable distribution. Alberta actually, I'm not sure used to be the highest in terms of income inequality, but I think another uh, province has, has overtaken recently. Hi, Roman. This question is from online. It's from Simon in Edmonton. Have you done any research into the effects of urban design on health? For example, Edmonton has pushed for mixed housing types in new neighborhoods and more walkable neighborhoods. Any thoughts on that? Um, no, I haven't, unfortunately. Um, that would be, that's actually a really good idea. I know of uh, work um, from Jim Dunn, who have, uh, he's probably the only one I could think of right now um, that that has been that has done work in looking at um, revitalization of neighborhoods um, in Hamilton, Ontario. Um, I also think Candice Nikoforic in our in our program in the School of Public Health is looking to um, uh, with the Healthy Communities Initiative in the School of Public Health. She is um, taking, a char taking the charge and trying to evaluate programs like that. So. Um, in some of your slides, uh, you showed a correlation between uh, income inequality in neighborhoods and uh, poor health outcomes. Uh, the areas that had uh, higher income inequality were also uh, tended to be inner city areas. So do you think it's, in fact, an effect of living in an urban area that gives you poor health outcomes? Well, um, so we did control for other factors. Um, Boston's pretty, that's only the city of Boston. Um, that map, for example, that was that was the city of. I know that the center core is more 
an equal in Boston, but for the most part, you know, that's a very urban area. And so we were, we were able to control for other characteristics of the neighborhoods, such as um, uh, proportion, um, uh, African American, median income, household income, um, these things could, that could actually distort the relationship between income inequality and um, uh, and the adverse mental health outcomes if you don't control for those or if you don't take those into account. So we were we did manage to include those. But yes, you're absolutely correct that when it comes to these types of studies, you do have um, selection bias where people um, they choose where they live. Right, and so like some, I think of something like San Francisco, which has high income inequality, because people choose from the from the dot com industry choose to live in San Francisco. But that being said, um, you know it is a selection bias, but we, we work our, we do our best with trying to work with data like that. We can't. The ideal situation would be to randomize people into um, low income and high income high income inequality neighborhoods, but that's pretty unethical. Okay. So. Uh, Thank you for uh, the sensitive way in which you presented a lot of the data here. But what's your thoughts on the role that researchers play in constructing narratives around poverty, race, income inequality um, that may be harmful in themselves yeah. through publication bias mm -hmm. and other systemic and structural um, constraints? Great. That's a, that's a, a really tough question. Um, I, I'm glad you brought that up. It's something that I have to work with, work at all the time. Um, you know, I have colleagues that, that work in diversity, access, and equity um, that look at my presentations, um, making sure that I don't, you know, it's come across um, as adding to stereotypes or adding to oppression. Um, so I think that's important. Um, so I, I, for a while, I worked for Toronto Public Health and I worked very closely with. Um, Diversity, access, and equity um, uh, workers, and to this day, they still I still try to um, collaborate with them. So, but thank you. Would you encourage other researchers? Yes, definitely. To I would encourage employ, um, all researchers to to. And I think that even in, when you apply for grants, um, you're asked to incorporate um, working with diversity, access, and equity um, people, workers. Hi, Roman. This one is also from online. It's from Young from Kingston. Hi, Young. I know <laughs> her. <laughs> Roman, thanks for your talk. I'm wondering if you have any resources on measuring intersectionality, not just aspects of discrimination, such as income inequality or racism, quantitatively. That's actually a really good question. I'm, um, if anyone, any of the researchers in the room could, uh, knows that answer. Um, it's a hard, question, hard thing to measure quantitatively. Uh, and I think as an epidemiologist who works quantitatively with, uh, with data, um, it's, it's, you know, you probably face, a lot, epidemiologists probably face a lot of criticism. I encourage um, looking at Nancy Krieger's work um, uh, in, at Harvard School of Public Health. Um, and also uh, working with um, people in other disciplines. So for example, um, people in social behavioral um, uh, uh, in the school of public health, you know they they all have uh, resources um, uh, working with intersectionality. I have another one from online that I can ask. Okay. Um, so this is from Camilla. She's joining us from Ottawa. Oh, hi, Camilla. I know her too. <laughs> As Canada's aging population increases, do you believe that the income inequality gap will broaden? I'm sorry. If as Canada's aging population increases, do you believe that the income inequality gap will broaden? Aging? Did, did you say aging? It, aging? Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, that's a tough question. I mean, I think it, when it comes to income inequality, it has to do with, my point of view, it has to do with policy um, and what, what policies are put in place um, to help redistribute the wealth. Um, that's what I think, anyways. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, my question was, do you know what types of programs or policies that the public, the School of Public Health is doing in terms of research to help make these social changes and solve some problems in their own community? Um, can I open the floor to the faculty of School of Public Health that could help me answer that question? Uh, 
So as an epidemiologist, I, look, I like to look at um, you know, inequality. Um, it's hard, like I've been, I think I repeat, I um, uh, addressed this in the, in the presentation. I'm looking at um, increases in minimum wage, so which is, um, which has uh, been proposed as a way to, to decrease income inequality. So we're, um, with the help of the trainees, um, um, we're hoping to evaluate that. Um, anyone from public health wanna? Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, the sustainable, the, these social determinants of health have been around for quite a while already, so thank you for addressing an issue using them. Uh, do you, are you aware of any work being done using the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? Oh. And all of these issues. Okay, um, so I just submitted a grant to, to address a couple of those. Um, income inequality is ranked number uh, seven. Gender inequality is ranked number five, I believe. So, um, so I'm uh, looking to look at um, income, uh, income inequality and gender inequality within schools. It's been very um, limited in terms of uh, more proximal or more smaller um, areas where students, where adolescents are found, um, where they spend more a majority of their waking hours. So I'm working on a couple grants looking at that right now. Um, does that answer your question? But in terms of other researchers that are looking at evaluating the sustainable those sustainable goals, I'm not sure. You know. Roman, here's another question from online. Okay. We have 38 people joining us online, so okay. it's a very engaged group. Um, this is from Christine in Calgary. She's wanting to know if the work you did in Calgary on income inequality is based on the, I may pronounce this wrong, Gini coefficient? Yes. Yes. Gini. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Uh, using the, I forgot to mention, it's uh, using the All Our Families uh, cohort study. Um, uh, which is the PIs are uh, Suzanne Tuff and Sheila McDonald. Oh, thank you, Dr. Pabai, for a very interesting talk. Uh, my question was specifically related to the role of gender in terms of how some of the policies uh, and laws are implemented and come into effect. So, for example, with abortion, it is not an actual law. So it is not, it's not set on paper that abortion is legal. So do you think that gender plays a role in that? Do you think that a lot of our, role, a lot of our laws are being uh, made by like men in terms of, and do you think there's that inequality in terms of uh, gender? Does that make sense? Right, I do think, um... Like I point, when I pointed out the, the the proportion of members of parliament and the proportion of uh, uh, Canada's population, how it's skewed away from women, away from indigenous um, uh, um, pop, uh, populations and, and visible minorities, I do think that if we have a more um, there's things that could be brought into debate that aren't really thought of. Um, when you have a more homogenous group of members of parliament or MLAs. Um, so I did mention the, how when, you know, the, the stark differences when there were more women on the Supreme Court versus when there was just one or even none. You know, there was, um, uh, I brought that up. But I also, I, I think, um, you know, I think when there's more of a, a, a diversity within um, the, the members of parliament, it reflects um, better the population and also um, addresses their needs too as well. Um, and I didn't want, I, I could go on and on about um, the, the, the first past the post system in Canada. I don't think it does um, Canada uh, minorities, uh, people who experience um, oppression and discrimination, I don't think it does us any, uh, does, does a favor. I think we need to relook at how we elect our members of parliament and people and, and M, uh, MLAs or MPPs. I think we do need to relook at that and see um, how people are bringing, brought into positions of power. Um, I think more of a proportional um, representation um, seems uh, is more just. Are there one last question? 
Wonderful. Let me add um, about the School of Public Health. I'll give you a couple of examples of people working on areas related to this. One is Candice that uh, Roman talked about already in looking at healthy communities and environment. And so what she's looking at is typically we look at a person and say they're not walking enough or not eating properly. So she's looking at the interface of place and people and how that affects. And so that brings up the income inequality piece. The second area that I will uh, highlight is looking at food environments. Dr. Kim Dorsch and Kate sorry, who are uh, sitting here, both dietitians who work in different diverse communities to look at how the affordability, availability in all of those factors intersect in the healthy food provisions that are available. So don't hesitate to check our website out if you're interested. Their work is highlighted. And this presentation is also taped and it will be available online tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, if you're interested in uh, looking at it again or sharing it with somebody else who might be interested. So just wanted to put that uh, out here. The second is as you were coming in, you would have received a feedback form. It would We would really appreciate if you can take the two minutes to fill it out. That informs our planning for the next seminar. So your feedback is very valuable. The third thing that I want to say before um, a big round of applause for uh, Roman is to say refreshments are available outside. And so you can come mingle and enjoy and talk more about this topic. And so finally, please join me in thanking Roman for this exciting and important talk. <laughs>